This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Mori. We are now dealing with the principles of approach concerning the doctrine of justification. One of the things that is missing today when there is even the attempt to preach in depth on theology, the doctrines of the Bible, is that you need to set forth some principles of approach that will guide you in terms of how you approach a subject. Now, this was not with our forefathers. In the days of our pilgrim and Puritan forefathers, they often would spend a great deal of time on principles of approach. Before they handled the topic, they knew there had to be several things dealt with before they got there. It is called the pedagogical method of teaching. That is, you don't go to a small elementary school kid, let's say he's eight years old, and you tell him, all right, I want you to solve this algebra problem. Well, the kid hasn't really even got to arithmetic yet. Before you can understand algebra, you have to understand certain other disciplines before you get there. You can't even go to a high school student and talk to him about quantum mechanics and higher physics and talk about calculus because you have to have certain things understood before you get to other things. Now, as we approach the whole subject of the doctrine of justification is found in Scripture. Our first principle of approach is that we acknowledge the difference between revealed theology and natural theology. Volume 1 of the Journal of Biblical Apologetics, which you can order at the table, is dedicated to illustrating the difference between these two approaches to theology, to God. If you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to see the contrast between natural theology, which is described as a complete failure in chapter 1, and then the Apostle Paul directs us to revealed theology. So you see, when it comes to the issue of the knowledge of God, there has always been two ways, really only two. Man starting with himself, by himself, from himself, seeking to understand the universe around him and to understand God and how man and God and the world relate to each other is the essence of humanism. Humanism is ever looking within yourself to one of three things. The rationalist believes that the real is the rational and the rational is the real, and they really think their IQ is so high, they don't need God to tell them anything. You can put them in a room, turn out the light, and they'll put their head and become the thinker. And by sheer brain power, they will tell you they can come to a knowledge of God's existence, His attribute, His nature, the gospel, what is justification, what is all this... Uh, they can tell you by brain power. Now, there are those who realize how futile this is because every philosopher who's ever come along has already rejected all the philosophers who went before him. So it doesn't matter if you're dealing with the pre-Socratics, and the greatest of this was Heraclitus and then Parmenides. Heraclitus was famous for saying, all is flux, pantare in Greek. Everything is relative. You never put your foot in the same river twice because you step in one foot, and by the time you get the other foot, has the water moved. Everything's relative. There are no absolutes. Anything that seems to be permanent is an illusion. Everything is in a constant flux, a boiling cauldron of change and chaos based on pure luck. That was Heraclitus. Then there was Parmenides who said, no, all is one. And change is the illusion because actually there's no change, no motion, 
everything is actually one in a frozen moment. Then Plato came along and says, well, I'll simply make a sandwich. I'll put Heraclitus as the world of matter and Parmenides as the world of mind, and thus he solved philosophy by having matter in mind, which was nothing more than having Heraclitus and Parmenides as a peanut butter sandwich. And everybody before Socrates and Plato was wrong. Then along came Aristotle and says, well, Plato didn't solve anything. He merely shuttled the furniture from one room to the other. How does putting Heraclitus here and Parmenides on top solve anything? And he came up with his brilliant solution instead of matter, mind. And what is matter? Never mind. And what is mind? Never matter. Aristotle said it's going to be form and essence. And the form of something did not necessarily have to relate to its essence. So it may look like your wife, smell like your wife, but really it's a piece of French furniture. You see, the form of something is no indication of what it really is. But then you see there was Plotinus after Aristotle who said he was all wet. And if you go through the history of philosophy, they're Xing out everyone before them because, to quote one French philosopher, reason is a whore. She'll sleep with anyone. She's cheap. And in the end, the Apostle Paul, who had studied philosophy, now he was an educated man, he refutes the idea that the best clergy are the most ignorant. Really, there are people who believe that. They want a pastor who is ignorant because if he's ignorant, he'll be happy. If he knows too much, well, he'll get sad. Well, the Apostle Paul was an educated man who had studied philosophy. He could quote from the philosophers. That's why to the Corinthians who were in love with Greek philosophy, he had this to say beginning in chapter 1 and verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Notice the grammar. It says those who are already perishing. People are not lost because they reject Jesus. They are already perishing. We are born dying. We are born with our feet pointed in the direction of the abyss. But when we preach the message of the cross of Jesus Christ to those who are already perishing and on their way to eternal perdition, it's foolishness. Now this, of course, is how I prove the gospel is true. Remember one little atheist Jewish girl in Greenwich Village when I worked with Teen Challenge for I did many things. How many of you can see me working for Teen Challenge one summer? Yes, absolutely. Dave Wilkerson's mom was a sweetheart. Noodle brain, but sweet. And this little atheistic Jewish girl came in and she wanted the soup and stuff and we had a little coffee house down in the basement called the Cornerstone. And I said, well, I'll get you your food in a minute, but I'm supposed to talk to you. See, before they get the food, they've got to bear with you witnessing to them. You know, they, they got to pay for it by listening. She said, how do you know the Bible's true? I said, because you prove it to me. What do you mean? I said, every time you open your mouth, you prove the gospel. She said, how? I said, you've heard the gospel. I've given it to you. Yeah. Is it foolishness to you? Yes. I said, well, it says to those who are perishing, it's foolish. You just won. You just proved that verse. Do you fear God? No. Well, over here, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Every time you open your mouth, you prove the gospel. But to those of us who are saved, the preaching of the cross is what? The power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the philosophy of the philosopher. You must understand to the Greeks, the climax of the human intellect was the development of philosophy. The attempt to understand yourself, the gods, the world, and everything from yourself, by yourself, 
without any assistance from any kind of deity, you could say, I'd rather do it myself. And here the Apostle Paul says, listen, you must understand that God said, I'm going to destroy philosophy. And the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Now this actually is not a good translation. It should have referred to the fact of those who were sophists, who were very shrewd and asking nasty questions. If you ever read Plato's dialogues, I had to translate them from the Greek. You will read him arguing with one such gadfly by the name of Thrasymachus. So these are the very clever type fellows. Can your God do anything? Can he do everything? Can he make a rock so big he can't move it? See, they think they're so clever. Where is the philosopher? Where is the scribe? Where is the sophist debater of this age? You see, they love debates. They love them. Discussions. The wilder, the better. That's why they were willing to listen to Paul. They said, what does this babbler want to say? Where is the debater? Has not God made foolish the philosophy of the world? Now, remember, the world was saying that the preaching of the cross was what? Foolishness. God returns the favor. You call it foolishness? You want to know stupidity? You want to know foolishness? Go study Greek philosophy. God has made foolish the philosophy of this world. For since in the philosophy of God, the world through its philosophy, and if you underline in your Bible, you are now going to underline, and if you've never done it before, do it now. The world with all of its intellectual activity and philosophic wisdom, did not know God. Does it say that? But Socrates knew God. You mean that Plato didn't? And what about Aristotle and Thales and Anaximerus? And you mean Heraclitus? And Paul said the sum total of all the philosophies of all the philosophers of every age and every continent and every tribe and every tongue. They never knew the true God. God was well pleased, Greek, he was happy, through the foolishness, now you see how he turns it, the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So here the Apostle Paul says, the great climax of man's intellectual activity, the philosophy, the sophists, the debaters, the best of the golden age of Greece, in the end when the rubber met the road, they never found God. And you see, this is where Christians have forgotten. I did an article, Do We Need Aristotle? Do you know how many Christian colleges tell the kiddies, oh, we go to Plato and Socrates and Aristotle to find out about God. You can read Peter the Creep, or known as Peter Kreft, who in his book states the Greek philosophers knew God better than the Christian theologians. I think Paul had it right. But does this mean that the Christian should not engage in intellectual pursuits? Well, it depends on what you mean. You can use your intellect in a humanistic way by starting from yourself, by yourself, looking within yourself to your reason, to your emotions, or to your experience, and it's still, all of that is still you. 
and then you use your mind to extrapolate beginning with yourself or you can begin with the revelation of God as given in Scripture and then use your intellect. There's nothing wrong with using your brain as long as you use it correctly. It's like fire. Fire in a fireplace is good. Yavul. But in the living room, on the curtains, nicht sehr gut. Human reason, as long as, as it is the handmaiden of revelation, is a good girl, and she be no hoe. When human reason stands up on the street corner and promises you everything, she beat a hoe. This is why the Apostle Paul goes on to state, now when I came, chapter 2 and verse 1, and preached at Corinth, I knew that you people were idiots. You were in love with Greek philosophy. So I was determined, verse 2, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, when I started out in Corinth, I preached that which I knew you would not like. He said, I went right to it, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins because we are sinners on our way to eternal perdition. And the philosophers don't like it when you talk about hell. They never have and never will. It's not polite, you know. We can discuss God ad infinitum, ad nauseum. But the moment you bring up hell and judgment, oh, 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 wait a second. So he went right to the heart to preach the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his atoning work. But then if you look at verse 6, but, some translations read, or yet, yet or but, we do speak philosophy among those who are spiritually mature. A kind of philosophy, however, that does not come from this age, nor from the rulers of this age, who, by the way, are here today and gone tomorrow. But we speak God's philosophy in a mystery. It is a hidden philosophy which God predestined before the ages to our glory. This philosophy, which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. By the way, if you ever want proof of the deity of Christ, underlying the phrase, the Lord of glory, one of my heroes, B.B. Warfield, Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield of Princeton, one of the greatest theologians the United States ever produced, has an entire volume entitled The Lord of Glory, demonstrating from the Old Testament that when the Apostle Paul referred to Jesus as the Lord of glory, this was without a statement that he was Jehovah God. They crucified the Lord of glory. If they would have only understood that this was all according to the divine master plan, they would have never cooperated. But just as it is written, now very carefully, things which... I has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which has not entered the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. But to us God has revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. If you want proof of the deity of the Holy Spirit, this is one of the primary texts of the New Testament. 
Matter of fact, when it says the Spirit searches, then you see the phrase all things. The word all in Greek is put in the syntax that you would shout it. He is actively comprehending all things. Now, in case there were any nimnu in the audience, when he said all things, does that mean the Spirit is omniscient? Yes, he has all knowledge. But does that include that the Spirit of God would understand God? <gasps> Look what it says. Even the depths of God. That is, the Holy Spirit is continuously in complete awareness of all things, including an infinite understanding of the infinite nature of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now, he's reasoning very close. He's using his intellect. Do you think you understand God, Socrates? Hmm? How about you, Plato? What about you, Aquinas? So you think you're so smart that you know the thoughts of God, right? You are capable of plumbing the depths of God, scaling the heights of God, spanning the breadth of God. Well, really? Really? Is that where you are? No one knows the thoughts of God except whom? The Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Remember verse 9, he quoted the Old Testament, human eye has never seen, human ear has never heard, the human mind has never had the idea go through the brain. All that God has prepared. In other words, natural theology is what you can understand with your eye, your ear, and your mind, which is zip, zero, nada. You see, he's putting them in a box. He is saying, do you understand it is only the Spirit of God who understands the things of God? And now the Spirit of God is going to reveal these things to us, and then we can know. So people usually quote verse 9 thinking it's about heaven. Every little old lady knows, well, I has not seen, and when we get to glory... And that's not talking about heaven. It's talking about a condemnation of natural theology. The Holy Spirit, who is from God, was given to us that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human philosophy, but in those words taught by whom? The Spirit. Combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand it, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Now comes the challenge. For who has known the mind of the law? So the rationalist, the mystic, and the empiricists say, I do, I do, Mr. Carter. No, you don't. You don't know the mind of the law. Not by human means. 
Since you do not know the mind of the Lord, he's not waiting for you to instruct him. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct God? We all love to be cosmic backseat drivers. Turn left, turn right, stop, let me off. God just keeps driving. He has his own appointments to make. And when it's time for you to exit the bus called life, the wheels will come to a screech and he'll open the door and says, it's time for you to get off. And either you step out of the bus to an escalator going up or an escalator going down. Then the Apostle Paul, having talked about Scripture, you must understand the revelation of God. Scripture is giving us spiritual thoughts combined with spiritual words. The words of Scripture are from the Spirit of God. They are not from human ingenuity. This is the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility of Scripture. And then he makes one of the most stupendous statements, a description of Scripture that they have been fainting over since the early church. We have the mind of Christ in Scripture. What this is, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at this, encyclopedia of 66 books. This is the mind of Christ. You want to know what the Messiah thinks about salvation? It's in here. You want to know what's on his mind about family living? It's in here. You want to know the mind of Christ on anything? It's in the Word. Don't go to human philosophy. So when we talk about justification, I want to have the mind of Christ on justification. I don't want Plato's mind. I don't want Thomas Aquinas. I don't want Luis de Molina. I don't want any heretical. I don't want Karl Barth. I don't want Brumer. I don't want Moltmann, Boltmann, and all the rest of them. I'm going for the gold. I want the mind of Christ. And that's what you have in Scripture. Thus, down through the centuries, Christian theologians have virtually danced in the aisles holding their scriptures saying, this is the revelation of the mind of Christ. You want to know what's on the mind of Jesus for you? This is the will of God, even your sanctification. You want to know what the will of God is? It's in there. You just have to find it. Observe the differences between exegetical theology, biblical theology, systematic theology, and historical theology. Now, Dr. Bob, are you, why are you telling in this particular section here? Because you are a min, if you're a born again Christian, you are a minister of the gospel. How many Christians are here? How many ministers of the gospel are here? The same group that raised the first time should be raised. You were drafted into the ministry when Jesus chose you. He says, you didn't choose me, honey. I chose you. You better get that straight. You love me, but I first loved you. I died on the cross for you before you were twinkling in your daddy's eye. 2,000 years ago, your grand, 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 pappy, 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 pappy's eye. Well, you see, theology has various disciplines. Part of the reason there has been a breakdown in evangelical theology at the end of the 20th century and now going into the 21st century is that the disciplines have collapsed. We no longer have schools which teach these things in a distinct manner. How many of you recognize, you must recognize, that the evangelical world is in the state of theological confusion and chaos? You have people who say there's no hell, God doesn't know the future. You have complete chaos. It's because 
of a lack of education and understanding that there are different disciplines in theology. The first basic kind of theology is called exegetical theology. Now the word exegetical comes from John 1.18. No one has ever seen God at any time, but God the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has exegeted him. Now the word exegesis is from which we got our word excavate. When you're going to ex excavate an ancient ruin, you dig down and uncover what is there or what you're going to build there. You want to excavate by digging down till you find the original foundation, the original building, the original inhabitant, the original pots and pans to do your work as an archaeologist. Thus, exegetical theology is the skill of digging down into a verse until you get to what the author was saying, what was in his mind, his point. It doesn't matter about your feelings. This is not that cheap inductive Bible study method. Hi, Mary. Well, what does this verse mean to you? Well, my boyfriend told me, she goes off, well, Tommy, what does the verse mean to you? I feel, and you get 20 different I feels from the same verb. <clears throat> That's eisegesis, not exegesis. Now, exegetical theology asks about specific passages. For example, turn to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. I will use the doctrine of justification. An exegetical theologian, and that's, if you wonder where I fall, that's where I am considered. I'm considered one of about five living exegetical theologians, that's all that's left. D8, my good friend Don Carson, there's about five of us left. John Murray being the, the grandpappy and one of the great exegetical theologians I had the privilege of sitting under him at Westminster, but he is gone. An exegetical theologian says, what does this verse say to me about whatever the topic is? In this case, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The exegetical theologian says, I don't care about the verse before, the verse after, I don't care about the history of the... I only have one concern. I want to know what does this verse say to me about justification. And then he goes in to do the fine grammatical syntactical exegesis. For example, he'd say, well, the word therefore. Wherefore is therefore there? Now that you should immediately let that come to your brain. Every time you see the word therefore. Wherefore is therefore there? Meaning this is a conclusion, the end of a proposition. Therefore means we now conclude from what we've just said. And what he just said, verse 25 of chapter 4, he was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our what? Justification. That is, the death of Christ removed our transgressions and sins because he paid them off on the cross. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. But you see, there's more to the work of Christ than dying. By his resurrection, he provided for our justification. Justification springs from the life 
of Christ, just as the atonement springs from the death of Christ. And because he was delivered on the basis of our transgressions, he died for our sins, the Lord was pleased to lay upon him the iniquity of us all, and he was raised bodily on the third day in order that we might be justified. Therefore, wherefore is therefore there. So we know that the first verse of chapter 5 is the conclusion of a series of arguments and thoughts found in chapter 4. So verse 1 does not begin a chain of reasoning. Verse 1 is the conclusion of a chain of reasoning. Having been justified, it is in the aorist tense, which means a completed action. The tenses in the Greek text are more illustrative, are more definitive in terms of nuances of thought than the English language. The aorist tense is like this. It's a completed act. Having been slapped, she went home. All right? It is a completed action. It is not this. There is a way in Greek that he could have written being continuously justified as a process. Instead, he wrote in the Greek, having been justified once for all in one completed act. So justification is an act of God, a completed act, that happens and then it is finished. It is not an ongoing process. So by its nature, we know that it takes place in the past at a time, a place, and it's completed. Otherwise, he wouldn't have used that particular construction. Then it says that having been justified, we will look and we will show you how the word justified means declared not guilty by the judge of heaven and earth in the courtroom of heaven. Having been declared not guilty, just like you go before the court and the judge says, what is your verdict, jury? We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. And then you hear that. And you know what? What does double jeopardy mean? You can't be tried again. Not guilty. A legal verdict. Innocent of all charges. Not guilty. Released. No longer facing eternal sentence in hell having been declared not guilty as a legal verdict. But how? Through faith. Does it say baptism? Does it say works? Does it say dancing, leaping, jumping, vomiting, rolling on the ground, barking, woof, 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 hissing? Oh, there's a relationship that faith is the means whereby we receive the not guilty verdict and it by nature is a once and for all completed act. But what's the result? Oh, well, it says, therefore, we have. You see, there's a comma after therefore, isn't there? Hmm? And is there a comma after the word faith? Hmm? Now, I know it's going to be difficult. But you've got to imagine what he's writing is he was raised because of our justification, therefore we have peace with God 
through our Curios Jesu Christu Baruch Hashem. You see, grammatically, there is a parenthetical phrase when it says, having been justified by faith. That's a little clause, you see. And that's why they put a comma here, a comma here, so you might connect. The therefore goes over, connects to this. Everybody see me with me? I'm trying to teach a Greek grammar. It's not easy. He was raised to our justification, therefore, having been justified by faith. What do we get out of it? Well, we are now at peace. We are no longer the enemies of God. What? Verse 10. While we were what? You see, we were the enemies of God, and he was our enemy, and we were his. Instead of war, because of justification, there is now a truce. We now have peace. Now, does it say of God or with God? or from God, or in God, or by God. What is the preposition? Well, it's not talking about the subjective. I've got peace like a river in my soul. We're not talking about that. It means the official war between you and God is now over. You now have peace with God. How? Through our, now comes three words. Curios Jesu Christu. Did he simply say Jesus? Mm hmm. Did he simply say the Lord? Mm -mm. Did he simply say Christ? Mm -mm. When I taught the book of Romans from the Greek text, and the students all had to have the Greek, and I took them through the Greek of the book of Romans, one of the assignments was this. Give me a chart of in the book of Romans, when he only uses the word Jesus, when he only uses Christ, when he only uses Lord, when he has combinations, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, Christ the Lord, Jesus the Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ the Lord, Christ Jesus the Lord. I, I want to know every combination of the titles because God, to quote Einstein, does not play dice. Does anything happen by chance? No. And he says, Lord, then Jesus, then Christ. And to an exegetical theologian, the little gray cells say, why did he say that that way? Why in other places did he change the order? Why in other places did he just say Jesus? There's a reason. And the exegetical theologian goes, why he puts Lord first? Remember Peter said, by the resurrection from the dead, God hath declared him to be Lord. See, you've got to use the great sound. See, an exegetical theologian says, I want to know what this verse says to me, then you move to another verse on justification. Now, the biblical theologian doesn't care about Romans 5, 1. They're not into grammar. Instead, the biblical theologian says, I want to know the evolutionary progress of the deepening of understanding 
of the authors of Scripture that when you begin with Abraham, whose faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, and you get to David, and who recognized that sin would not be imputed unto him, how that the concept of justification deepened and developed as you move through Scripture because you get more pieces of the puzzle as more of the Bible is revealed. So Hebrews 11 and verse 1, uh, well, even more to the point, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says, God spoke to our prophet, to our fathers through the prophets in drips and drafts. Any of you ever build a sand castle for yourself or your child? Every parent has to build a sand castle. Particularly if he's got a daughter, you've got to scoop it up and make it big. Remember how you dribbled out the sand? That's how the Bible was given to us. This is 66 books, 40 authors, over 2,000 years. Don't think it's one book. It's not one book. It's 66 scrolls. He gave a little bit. He gave a little bit. Now, until the sand castle is finished, do you see it in its entirety? Until Scripture was finished, you didn't see everything. So the biblical theologian, what was the process of thought that led up to the point that Paul could say this? A systematic theologian says, well, I'm not interested in Romans 5.1, and I'm not really interested in the process or called the progress of doctrine. I want to know what does the whole Bible say to me about the doctrine. And I've given you a systematic theology outline below. A systematic theologian would say, I want to know the nature of justification. What is it? The origin of justification. Where does it come from? The basis of justification. Upon what is it based? What is its legal basis? The means of justification. How do we obtain it? The attributes of justification. What is it like? The time of justification. Is justification something that is done in eternity on the cross or in our conversion? When does it take place? The effects of justification. What good is it? The evidence of justification. What proof do we have whether or not we have ever been justified? See, a systematic theologian automatically thinks nature, origin, basis, means, attributes, time, effects, evidence, like a train. And the systematic theologian usually only does proof taxing. So if you buy a systematic theology book, how many own a systematic theology book? Do you notice it'll have a parenthesis and a lot of verses? And th do they do any exegesis? No, because they're not exegetical theology. They're just going to give you verses. And then they go on. They give you what's called proof texting. Lastly, historical theology, that's the theologian who gets curious as to how has the Christian church understood this doctrine down through the centuries? Preaching Sunday morning on the giving of offerings and how that this began in the Garden of Eden and how that Adam, as the high priest of his family, taught his family to come into the presence of God with presents and gifts. You don't go into the presence of God empty-handed. You give God the best that you have. And the story of Cain and Abel illustrating that it was something normal and usual. And then the question arose, Cain clearly saw that his offering of some dried up, withered old fungusy vegetables was not accepted by God. But Abel's was. How did he know? Well, I went to the Yehudim, the Jews. And I looked in the Midrash, I look in the Jewish writings, then I went to the early church fathers. I'm curious. I want to know. Then I went to Matthew Henry. 
and I went to the Lutheran loopholes, and I went to the great commentary, and they said, well, it was very simple. In those times, the family would come together, present the offering to God on a rock, and God would cause it to be spontaneously combusted, and it would go up in flanks. And this happened in, in the book of Judges. There's many instances of this. So here's Matthew Henry. Here's this. See, historical theologian says, I feel comfortable with this doctrine because the pilgrims, the Puritans, the reformers, the best of the church fathers, the apostolic fathers, the rabbis, this is something that was understood by the people of God for millenniums. And who are we to think that we're smarter than all of them put together? So the historical theologian is not interested in exodus. The historical theologian is interested in keeping the church from fighting over the same issues all over again. That's the job of the historical... Now, the last great historical theologian died a hundred years ago. His name was William Cunningham. And you can get his historical theology in about two volumes. There aren't any. Well, there's one... I guess we could, play, though he's very much a Renaissance man. And his work on justification, indeed, does a lot of historical theology. Your seminaries used to have separate departments for each of these disciplines. Guess which one was the ground floor and the foundation of the other? Exegetical theology numero uno. And then on the basis of the exegesis, there could be the biblical theology. On the basis of those two, then came systematic theology, and historical theology was the whipping cream on top of the cake. But what has happened today? The liberals are all into biblical theology. They only want to talk about the will of the wisp and relativism and how doctrine was fluid and changing and no one knew what they believed. So they have twisted it to mean John's view is different from Paul's view, which contradicts James' view. And they end up with a Bible full of snarling, snapping authors, each who had their own pet doctrine. There's no unity, just diversity. We have a few systematic theologians left. Wayne Grudem has put out one. You have about two others who have put out some. But really, basically, it's dead. Historical theology is dead. Exegetical theology is dead. You say, well, where's everybody? They're now in philosophic theology. What is philosophic theology? J.P. Moreland, William Lane Craig, good men, people who love the Lord, but who do theology from human philosophy. And there's legions of them. Or psychological theology. James Dobson has helped me on many points, raising a, a strong-willed child is one of them. But think about this. When Larry King wants to talk with a Christian theologian, he calls a theologian or a psychologist. Does Dr. Dobson know Greek or Hebrew? Exegetic? No, no, no. We live in a day and age when the psychologists have more authority about what God is than the exegetical theologians. When the philosophers will say that they know who God is and the biblical theologians should shut up, move over, and sit down. That when you confront these philosophic or psychological theologians who derive not from scripture but from human experience, and you demand exegesis, they laugh at you. It is enough. We have our reason. There is no need for Scripture. Now do you understand we are in a mess, people? 
We are theologically in bad shape because the church is no longer guided by Scripture and those who give their lives to study it. This is not to disparage the motive of good men. As I said, J.P. Moreland is a good man. I've enjoyed meeting and talking with him. But in terms of his approach, and William Lane Craig and most of the apologists on the radio today, they are philosophic theologians, not biblical theologians. They will be quick to give you their opinion and very slow to give you God's opinion. As we deal with the subject of justification, we're going to be looking at what is it? Where does it come from? Upon what is it legally based? How do we obtain it? What is it like? Where does it take place? When does it take place? What good is it? And what proof do we look for in our lives that we have been justified by grace? I have taken the time to do these principles of approach because I believe the average Christian has never been taught this. How many of you have had the light bulb go on on different issues already this evening? How many of you see things, you understand why the church is in a mess? As long as exegetical theology is the queen of the sciences. All is well. Philosophy is the handmaiden of the exegetical theologian. But when the other disciplines become the queen and theology only becomes a handmaiden, heresy will abound. You have come to the end of this lecture. To continue with the series, Please listen to the next lecture.